Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, October 8th. Today's topic is Confessions of a Learning Revolutionary. Our special guest today is Steve Hargadon and he will be joined later by Jonathan Fritzler. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning, and Paula Noggle. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy who will now introduce Steve. Well, welcome to all of you. This is going to be a great day. I'm so excited to have Steve Hargadon and his colleague, Jonathan Fritzler, with us today for a very special conversation. This will be a little bit different than some of our typical um, webinars, which are primarily presentations, and I know you're going to love it. Many of our regular Classroom 2.0 Live participants have been with us from the very beginning, back in 2009. And many of you have joined us gradually over the years. But all of us have benefited from Steve's inspiration and always thought-provoking ideas over the years. And today, he's going to share some of his insights on his journey of a le learning revolutionary, which I'm sure will challenge all of us in our roles as educators. Steve is the founder, mentor, and chief inspiration officer for Classroom 2.0 Live, and it is an honor for all of us to spend some time with him today. There have been many initiatives and steps along Steve's journey, and I've tried to include many examples in our live binder today. I'm going to do a really short introduction for Steve because we want to have as much time as possible for this conversation. And I have posted a much more extensive profile description in our live binder so you can explore that more later. Steve runs the Learning Revolution Project and for many years hosted a Future of Education interview series, which is just an amazing series of great conversations with educational leaders, among others. And all of those interviews are still available as recordings, and you'll find them in our live binder. He was also founder and chair or co-chair of many annual worldwide virtual events, including the School Leadership Summit, the Global Education Conference, and Library 2.0. And you often hear us talk about these in our shows. So Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to ask you to respond to our newbie question, and then I'll just turn everything over to you, and you can take us along on your journey. And of course, our newbie question is, what exactly is a learning revolutionary? Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Peggy, Lori, and Tammy, how fun to, to be watching you in action again. So I think the biggest part of this particular phrase that's of interest for today is that it's not an education revolutionary, but it's a learning revolutionary. And I'm going to explore without being sort of explicit about the difference between learning and education, but I think it will become evident. I'm going to explore kind of a journey I've gone on that's helped me to understand why uh, learning and education are not always synonymous, and why if you really sort of pursue the learning aspect of it, um, it may lead you in different paths. Is that good enough? Is that, a, is that enough of a teaser for us to start? That's just perfect. Take it away. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is called Confessions of a Learning Revolutionary, or the subtitle might be Why Steve Hargadon is Increasingly Less Interesting to People. Um, and I have really noticed this. And I've noticed that as I have explored topics outside of kind of traditional educational constructs or frameworks, that it, it's just less interesting. Uh, I think in part because it may be harder to understand, um, but I also think that um, you know we in our lives we are part of sort of larger structures, and uh, we sort of depend on the consistency of those structures to move forward day to day. And so when someone calls something into question, um, it's often just a place 
routes we don't want to go. Um, and I and I definitely have discovered that you know when I was asked to speak a lot about educational technology or Web 2.0 as the future of education, um, that as soon as I started kind of questioning why these initiatives sort of continue to cycle through but never really change the kind of core structure of education, that's just a lot less interesting to people. It's less of a cheerleading role. It's less of a kind of, um, um, okay, let's go get them now. It's, uh, it's much harder. And I find that maybe intriguingly I'm a little bit more interesting to the library world because they do stand a little bit apart of the traditional education structure and are in a position to kind of think about learning um, often as opposed to the structure of education. So let's play a little game. Let's do a little experiment. Uh, I'll call this a modest proposal. It's not about eating children, but it's uh, it's about children and eating. <laughs> so uh, I'd I'd like to propose that food and eating are um, incredibly important for children, right? So if you know the the reference to Swift, you know you'll understand the eating children concept. But the, this idea that Food is really, really important. Nutrition is incredibly important. And a lot of the future of children depends on their eating healthy food. And um, disease and cognitive ability, are, these things are all tied to nutrition and diet. So uh, my proposal is that because food is so important, that we actually need to manage and control the food that our children eat. So we should centralize food production and distribution. And we should have places where children go every day for each meal to receive the what we know to be the best food possible for them for their growth and development. Is anybody smiling yet? OK, so on the left side of this hamburger, why is that a good idea? I want you to feel free to use your text tool and type in why this would actually make sense. And on the right side, I'd be interested in having you tell me why we, we wouldn't do this. What would be the reasons that we wouldn't manage and control every meal that every child has? So I'll start us off on the left side. The, you know, the truth is that it's an important issue. Okay, and Kay says, no room for family choice. I'm going to put that on the right. Not every child is the same. Loss of individual choice. Food fads often change. On the left, their choice is important. Is that an argument for providing food for everybody, or did you want to put that on the right-hand side? Because I'd be interested if uh, if we would actually see choice as associated there with the with the centralized distribution, decision making and distribution of food. Food czar would be really smart. <laughs> I only want chocolate. <laughs> okay, um, yes. In my world, every child eats chocolate. So I'm interested that the right hand side is filling up a little bit more than the left-hand side. And I think this exercise is a really interesting one because I think that physical, um, uh, physical need, meeting physical needs and meeting mental, emotional, and learning needs are sort of comparably important. But somehow we feel like the idea that we would actually mandate the food and it would be centralized and would be a large organization just doesn't feel right to us. Right? And so the argument would be, OK, well, there are children who don't get good food. I mean, on the left-hand side, I would put, you know, what about children who really don't get fed well? We, we need to help them in the same way that we can say, what about children who, who, who don't have parents who are caring for their learning needs. Right? So there's a reality to the need. What's intriguing to me also about this food idea 
is that we've had some news lately. In the last few years, we've had really sort of interesting news. We had news about the food pyramid and the financial contributions that, in, that related to the, the government um, uh, issued guidelines for food. We had this past week the admission by um, Pepsi that, uh, a, a, that their, their purified bottled water was actually um, uh, just regular tap water. Uh, we had two weeks ago we had a, a disclosure from a Freedom of Information Act that the original studies on fat and heart disease done uh, by Harvard researchers in the 1950s that they were actually uh, funded by the sugar industry which was not disclosed at the time. And I think there's a general consensus that our view of fat and sugar and heart disease are actually almost exactly wrong. Right, so this is really interesting, right? This whole idea that we kind of at some level recognize that views of food and the science are um, that it might not make sense for us to actually be mandating food. And everything causes cancer. If you get into this, I've gotten into the food story quite a bit in the last couple of years because I have all these health issues and so I tried to really eat healthily, healthfully. And it's, it's pretty amazing the degree to which when you begin to look at this that, that, the, that the money involved in the commercialization of food really sort of dramatically impact what we're sort of told is settled science. And in particular, it's, it's pretty easy to look at the tobacco industry kind of debacle or the long period of time in which there was clear sort of lying and covering up and realize that a lot of that same kind of dynamic takes place uh, around food. Okay, so I think we've probably got the point here, right? I mean, I think that, that this isn't, what's interesting about this is we would, we would not want to go to a city and not have all these sort of small restaurants that cater to different needs. But somehow for, for learning, we definitely feel this um, need to, to, to uh, simplify and codify and for one group of people sort of determine what another group of people should learn. And that's not historically how we've looked at learning, right? It's a, it's a, uh, if you look at all the great quotes on learning, you know, we, we see learning and we, we talk about learning, we think about learning as really empowering individuals rather than being something that constrains and conforms them. So what I want to do is I want to actually go through a little bit of history here and tell you why this has become important to me because I've been involved in these different movements in ed tech and it's leading me in a different direction. I'm going to read the notes here just for a second. Okay, so this I'll promise to be brief here, but um, uh, um, 12 years ago I was refurbishing used computers and providing them mostly to schools. So at the time a new computer was about $1,000. We were providing used computers for about $300. Uh, we had a contract with Dell to do the refurbishment and two things happened. One was computers became a commodity and their prices fell dramatically. And the second was that Microsoft sued about 500 of us who were in the used computer business and claimed that we were violating trademark by, even though we had the original licenses for the computers, by not having the original CD-ROMs that the software had, had come on, that it was not legal to have the uh, computers go out with the license, go out with Windows again. And we were buying computers from Dell that had been off lease computers. They'd never had a CD-ROM. And there was a thing called first use doctrine, which legally seemed to indicate that, that this was legal, that, that once something was sold, that the person who sold it couldn't uh, constrain how it was then reused or resold. But the Microsoft contended in, the, in, in, this law, in this lawsuit, or these lawsuits against all of our companies, um, that software was licensed and it wasn't actually a product that you were buying. And in the middle of it, President Bush signed legislation codifying that software could be done as a license and not as a product. So um, it put all of us out of business because a trademark lawsuit goes against the officers of a corporation. You have no corporate protection. And so my, overnight my business was done. 
And we were about a $3 million business. I mean, it wasn't a huge business, but we did a fair amount of business. And we were it was good people and good employees and good stuff. And so, of course, I did sort of the backlash, which is I thought, okay, so, you know, uh, what are the alternatives to Microsoft that are free? And I started looking at open source software and started an interview series on open source software and education. And interviewed all the open source software greats. And some of you will know this. I took these open source software labs to ISD and all these other conferences. We'd have 20 or 30 used computers reconfigured for using OpenOffice and Firefox. And you would have, um, you know, you could build a lab for under $5,000 with 50 computers. In fact, $5,000 was probably enough for two labs. It was just incredible. But what I discovered was that was a really hard decision for people to make. The people who were making the purchasing decisions at schools were, were really worried that they would make a decision that would then five years later be criticized. And they weren't really in a pedagogical role, right? They weren't the ones who were saying, you know, how do does, how does students learn? Because if you learned the open source stack or the core programs for open source software, you probably could get a job out of high school. But if you, if you knew the core stuff, everybody was building websites and web pages and server farms. And so you could have gotten a job. But, but learning Microsoft Word and, um, and sort of big, you know, secretarial programs wasn't really that beneficial, but it was safe. And in the process of that interview series, I interviewed Mark Andreessen, who's, who basically created the web browser, Netscape. And he and his business partner, Gina Bianchini, had just started something called Ning. And it was a create your own social networking platform for for anything. And I thought, wow, this for educators, this would be huge. And people don't remember this, but I went around talking about using Ning to create educational social networks. And I was almost booed off the stage. And I can remember one audience, I spoke at a conference in Australia, and literally people said, this is wrong, this is bad, you shouldn't do it. And um, and, and, and there were a number of people who were, who were sort of well known in the ed tech community who, who said, this is just not a good idea. I don't like it. Um, and anyway, but uh, I ended up um, calling Gina Bianchini from Ning. I said, this is a big idea and I think you should hire me. And Ning did hire me. And so for 18 months I was a consultant as their, as their education consultant. And I went around talking about the use of Ning. And there are probably you know, at the time, tens of thousands of Ning networks that got started by teachers, large and small networks, um, you know, that came out of that initiative. And, you know, it, it's interesting to realize, okay, so what was it about social networking that was so compelling? And we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, then, then came kind of Web 2.0, right? So there was wiki spaces, there were all of these other ways in which user-generated content, right, became um, the the core understanding of the next level of technology, the phrase Web 2.0 being the, you know, wh why did these companies survive the dot-com bust? And they were all, um, this was not Tim O'Reilly and somebody else, they kind of came up with this idea that there were platforms that allowed for user contribution, right, and collaboration. Okay, so then we got, you know, Web 2.0, and it felt like that was like the big deal. And I meant to tell you, the open source thing really died when, when Google started providing email services because the, the biggest use for the platform for open source for schools had been setting up servers for, for email. And then when Google started offering uh, large scale email services for schools, it became very clear that this was not really about the openness and the freedom and the ability to look at code. It was really about the fact that it was no cost. Right, so open source kind of dies. I gave a talk at the O'Reilly Open Source Summit called Open Source Software is Dead in K-12 because it really kind of died. Then you have social networking and you have Web 2.0. You know, they really seem to offer these promises. Right now, we'll, we'll get to what those promises were. And then um, as part of Classroom 2.0 and, and this actual Classroom 2.0 Live and the Global Education Conference, I started holding online large-scale live meetups. Right, so it was the, using Blackboard Collaborate, which at the time was called Illuminate, to have people gather together in the same way they were gathering in these online spaces to gather together um, in, the, in the asynchronous spaces where they weren't 
you were typing in forum discussions, to gather together in a live setting online. And the biggest piece of that was the Global Education Conference. And uh, I'm trying to remember the first one, I think it was 2007 or 8. But you know, we had 400 and something sessions over five days, 24 hours a day. We had 53 keynote speakers. It was this incredible kind of massive open online event. <laughs> and, um, and I don't take credit for MOOCs, but at some point one of the, the creators of the MOOC said, yeah, we saw one of Steve Hargadon's events. And I mean, there was this sort of move of what we can, you know, we can do these large scale things online. Right, so then you had you know this potential of large online conferences, right? And and then you get um, the unconferences, right? And so EduBloggerCon uh, ten years ago, and it was sort of the first meeting of all the educational bloggers, and we held it at ISTE and um, held it in an unconference format. And you can see where that's gone, right? So let's let's now ask the question: Is is there a pattern here? Right, so I'll make the argument that um, each of these historical moments in the last 10 years has felt like it was going to change education. But in each case, I, I think good things have come from them, but I don't think education as a whole has changed. So my question is, what's the pattern? Can you see a pattern? And feel free to type on the screen or put it in the chat. Obviously, a pattern was more collaboration, more user participation. But why did why did I give a talk on K, open source and K twelve is dead? And why would I tell you that social networking hasn't actually changed the education? Or what would be what would be the pattern here? So someone wrote, still tool driven. Fear, start and stop based on a new thing. Fear factor, perhaps the change isn't perceptible. Tech will save us. Posse Salberg has used the phrase germ, the global education reform movement, to describe the way in which this sort of high stakes testing, high conformance education has really sort of spread around the globe. And and you can push back on my conclusion here, but my conclusion would be that largely we haven't really shifted the way we think about learning and education, that these tools have sort of become subsumed into the existing machine. Resistance to taking responsibility for own learning needs to become more mainstream, not just early adopters. Kids still sit in chairs and desks. The school ends when the bell rings. Yeah. You know, so if I remember when the computer came into the workplace, it dramatically changed how we did everything. But why hasn't that kind of dramatic change happened in education? IT, not educators. Yeah, I can remember in this last Hack Education, which is the new name for the unconference at ISTE, used to be EduBloggerCon, the Hack Education, I asked the question, how many of you work at a school where your technology decisions are driven by a learning philosophy? And I think three people raised their hands out of maybe 300. So it's not like the learning philosophy is changing and driving change. It's more like the tools come in, they give us this promise, right, and then they kind of become absorbed into the current structure but the structure hasn't really changed. High stakes testing has made teachers afraid to change. Change is hard, yes. Change is hard. Fear of change. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to move forward to the next slide because I think there is a pattern. So I think I'm going to propose, that in addition to the good answers that you've given, I'm going to propose two explanations for this. One is what I call the agency cycle, right? And so um, our youngest daughter is a freshman in college. And two years ago, she took AP World History in high school. It was the best class she's ever taken. It was the hardest class she'd ever taken. It challenged her like crazy. And I spent a lot of time helping her in that class. 
because it was just really challenging for her. And I read a lot of the textbook for the history of Western civilization, well, the history of civilization. And I came to the conclusion that the history of civilization is actually a history of power and control. There's a lot that goes on in history that's not power and control, but power and control are largely the driving forces of, his, of history. Who's in power, who has money, who makes decisions, and why. And this idea of agency, of, of the rise of democracy, of individuals having rights and privileges, and the ability to make decisions about yourself, that idea is a, a, a cyclical idea. right? It comes and it goes. And I think the same is true in education. The, the great promise of these technologies for me, for each of them, from open source to social networking to Web 2.0, these technologies and the unconferences, these technologies really held the promise of individuals regaining control of their learning, where someone else isn't telling them what to do, but they're actually making choices for themselves. And I think that's why they were so attractive to, to a lot of people. And we had this great sense that, that students would get on and they would collaborate and they could learn and they could get online mentors and they could sort of be in charge of their own education. And I think what happens is that the agency cycle plays with something that I'm going to call institutionalization. Right? And institutionalization is the way in which institutions need to stay in charge. Right? So like if you drive down the road and you look at any organization that has built buildings or has some significant investment in um, maintaining things the way they are because salaries and lives and all kinds of important things depend on them, you can see where institutions end up needing to perpetuate the current structure because so many people depend on that structure. That's not necessarily a bad thing. right? But when you, when you look at eight, the agency cycle and you look at institutionalization, you realize you know, in a lot of ways these two forces are kind of at odds with each other. Right? So this idea of self-direction is a little bit at odds with institutionalization. And we've seen some really interesting sort of ways in which we understand that's better because of the internet and the openness of information. Right, so this whole you know, revealing of the Harvard study being supported by the sugar industry, well, it totally makes sense, right? I mean, the sugar industry depends on profitability. The executives there depend on people you know, not seeing sugar as a bad thing. And so if you can associate heart disease with fat, then everybody's paycheck continues. And I'm not saying that's malicious necessarily. I mean, in the tobacco situation, you could probably say that there's you know, definitely sort of malicious intent, right? But it's almost sort of like it's the soft conspiracy of just perpetuating what you're doing. We have all of this investment. We have all these things going on. Some of you will have followed the mammogram uh, science recently, right? And, and it appears quite likely that, that mammograms may actually cause more breast cancer or false identifications of breast cancer than they actually save. Now, it's worth looking that up and kind of drawing your own conclusions, but there's such an industry behind mammograms and the machines, it's not like they're just going to say, oh, well, looks like the science has figured something out and we're going to shift, right? I mean, it's like that. there's so many jobs and things that depend on that, and we're seeing this sort of on a huge scale you know, with regard to banking and going to zero interest rates and the ways in which these things support the industry, but they're not necessarily good for the consumer or the individual. So I know I've gone pretty deep here, and it's a rabbit hole, but I want to make the case that we're seeing in ed, ed tech the same cycle play out, that the promise of agency, the promise that, that we are going to be able to provide for self-direction and individuality, get consumed by the institutionalization needs. And that that's actually kind of what happens in education. And Larry Cuban has talked about this. Many others have talked about this. I'm not discovering something new, right? But it's the way in which the education machine kind of takes innovation and brings it in and makes it a part of the existing structure. So for those of us in ed tech, for those of us who've watched this promise, who go through these cycles and think, OK, why do I get excited about this next cycle? And, and is there a better way? That's really kind of a difficult conundrum, right? Because um, 
I love social networking technology. Right? I love what Twitter and Facebook do. I love what Ning did and still hopefully does. I loved all of these these uh, things. But the truth is the world works in very pragmatic ways and money and financing are a significant part of that and, and defending institutional roles is the natural thing that people in those institutions do. You're a vice president in a large company. You're not going to just stand up and say, hey, guess what? <laughs> you know, uh, we're baby Mozart. We just got bought by Disney, but the science seems to show this is actually harmful to children, so we're just going to stop producing it. No, because there's just too much money involved. So what do we do? Right? This is the big question. This is the question I want to ask you today. And I want to and I want to propose one possible path that you can help me with. And I don't see Jonathan coming in the room yet, and it's possible that he may not come. I'm going to look in the chat here. So John I'll I'll describe a little bit about Jonathan. But so when we get to that point. So is there an answer? Right. Is there an actual answer? Right. So the Silicon Valley answer would be that the technology can kind of leapfrog these difficulties and, and without having to go through a lot of the pain of social change, it just kind of ch can change everything. And that's been at the core of the last sort of 15 years of the Silicon Valley effect. Right. You know, Wikipedia. You know, sort of dramatically changes information. Didn't have to go through competing financial models. You know, there's just this way in which the technology just dramatically makes a change. The other, another possible model is um, Clayton Christensen's disruptive innovation. Right, so that would be this idea that um, something from the outside that doesn't actually have to compete with the thing that's the existing one. Um, meets the needs of those who aren't served by the existing system and it ultimately grows and becomes larger and, and takes over. So the personal computer taking over mini and mainframe computers. And then there's the Gandhi Martin Luther King model, right, which is uh, sort of passionate demanding. You know, this is not okay. It's not okay that we, that we drug so many children under the age of five. It's not okay that we tell so many students, you know, basically that that the great majority of students who leave high school believe they're not good learners, right? That if you know if you're in the AP track or the honors track and you're getting into a good school, you feel good about yourself. But if you're not, you're basically told you're you know you're not one of the smart ones. You know the Martin Luther King Gandhi model would be you just stand up and say that's not okay, and we're going to protest. But it kind of depends on the you know the crowd saying believing that. Okay, so I'm going to pause there and let you either grab the microphone or put a note in the chat. So far, has what I described matched what you have felt? Do you have different feelings or ideas? What, what, what do you think we can do? So you can raise your hand. It's the second icon over, the third icon over, the hand icon in the participant box. and We'll give you the microphone, or you can put a note in the chat. Does anybody disagree with my conclusions? Cases, okay, do we need a mix? Yeah, is there a, is there a change strategy here that would be a mix of these? That's a really good question. Tammy? I think something that I've seen that's tangen tangential to that is that. Innovators in technology usually have an idealistic passion, but often they get bought by corporations that have more of a let's make a profit idea to it. So a lot of the I ideal yeah. the ideals of the originators are often lost. And that would seem very natural, right? I mean the reality is as a single individual, you can build something up and it doesn't have to make a lot of money and you can do it in the evenings. But if a company is going to buy it and make it larger, they're going to have to look at the realities of how people will actually pay for it. So I don't, you know, again, I really agree with you. And it seems like that's just kind of a part of the, of the conundrum, right? I mean, there's so much money in education that, that if you do something that's not going to produce money, it's just not going to get adopted broadly. So is the scope and scale of education part of its own dilemma creation? Meaning because things have to be so big, because the system is so big, 
that the sort of local efforts are, are very difficult. Google's buyout of third-party innovators is a good example, says K. Children's gain should be the profit we worry about, profit over innovation. Am I right in believing that we all have kind of core deep beliefs in the importance of every child and in their value? Right, so I would say like my kind of mantra is that, that every child has unique and inherent worth and value. And the question is, does our system actually reflect that? Peggy says she shares that core belief. Sherry says, I see many innovators get their PhD and sell books and they speak, then the sharing is gone. More and more educators demanding, expecting free resources. So if we go back to the hamburger idea, right, or the, this idea of feeding children food, is there, is there a degree to which the core idea, the practical, pragmatic idea, the core idea that you can centralize and make efficient education, is that part of the problem? Paula says no, I'm sorry, Patricia says no, the system forgets about the child, we worry about their scores. Yeah, so if, is this just an institutional dilemma? Do all institutions do this? Do they all start based on really good core beliefs and then do they end up needing to and depending on maintaining the institution versus the, the original core idea, right? I mean, if you, if you started an institution based on, on some passionate belief and then the institution has salaries and it's got all kinds of other overhead and, and things, is it just the natural consequence that, that institutions end up needing to perpetuate themselves more than serving that original interest? Okay, I want to propose an idea and Jonathan and I have been working on this, and now you have the background. I'm interested in what you think of this idea. Okay. <laughs> but does anybody else want to say anything before I move on? Peggy says, I think we believe it, but don't feel we have permission to stray from the required adopted standards and curriculum. Yeah, and there's an interesting thing here too, right, which is like if you're in the banking industry and five years ago you stood up and said, like at the Wells Fargo example, if you stood up and said what we're doing is unethical, you actually lost your job, right? So I know teachers who have said, I'm not going to teach this way, and they lose their jobs. They don't get their contract renewed, right? Because there is a system in place that needs to be followed. And, you can, and you, we know schools that have been really innovative schools, right, that in five or six years later, you know, they're back kind of doing things the way that they've always done them. Central control is less effective with so many people and so much diversity. So if we kind of question the core idea that we should actually be mandating one set of ideas, right, like the food, you know, that we, we kind of bristle at the idea that someone else would make decisions about our children's food and that they would presume to, to know exactly what to give each unique and individual child for any given meal, right, so if, if we and again, I know that's a leap, it's a stretch, but if you, if you can go there with me for a moment, right, so what, how do you, and looking at the different models of change, how do you look at those three different possible change models, the technological leap, the, um, the innovating from the outside, and the core passionate belief? Is there something we could do that we could get behind that would allow us to get out of this cycle of believing the next technology is going to save us and actually do something that changes the system. And I want to propose that maybe it has to do with libraries. So we've, we've got a, a love-hate relationship with libraries and librarians. You know, a lot of places have cut library staff and we believe the internet has sort of replaced the need for librarians. Um, but other places have really devoted more resources to the library and they've made it a maker space and kind of this vision of a community space. So what if we, in terms of thinking about the core need, the need to support individuals in their learning outside of the institutional need, what if we allowed librarians to play a role in taking the lead on that? So the idea that Jonathan and I have been playing around with is to help librarians start a hack your learning club. 
or a Hack Your Education Club. So creating a series of lessons or meetings that they can hold with students that actually allow students to see their education from sort of a meta level perspective, show them some movies about teaching and learning, do some exercises. Um, this is sort of a non-technology related solution, but the use of technology would greatly enhance it. But, but help librarians actually hold a series of lessons to, to tutor students and how to take their education into their own hands. And what Jonathan's done with this is he's done it in higher ed. So he's, he's worked with a couple of universities where they take their students through a six-week course and how to find their own interest in education and then to have every class they take and every paper they write map to their own personal learning journey. So whatever class they're in, whatever assignment they get, they, they work that into an understanding of what their own learning skill is. I don't think this is new, but this is sort of a liberal arts philosophy of education, right, that, that it frees you that, from liber, from the Latin to be free, that education is a freeing experience. So could we use the libraries and the librarians as the nexus for looking at learning from the perspective of the individual's learning and then sort of teaching students to evaluate and look at their learning within the context of their own desires and plans? Or is that too idealistic? And is it just another thing to get excited about that won't actually change the system? OK, responses. So we've set up a, like a six-week course that would help faci librarians facilitate such an activity with their students. Would, would this work? Would, li you know, would you encourage students to take it? Peggy, Tammy? <laughs> I'm going to jump in again. Um, not, not that everybody realizes that for our family, we, we've homeschooled and we've had uh, all four of our kids. And during the summer months, what I always had my kids do is they had to develop their own big project. They kept math going year round, but in the summer months, they had to, at the beginning of summer, they had to propose what their learning plan was for that summer, but it was in their hands. And they chose all kinds of interesting things that would take the whole summer to learn. Like, for instance, my, most of my kids took on an interest in learning how to create things in 3D with software and make their own uh, 3D games. And, and it would take the whole summer to do it. And they would produce, they would teach, they would, I didn't know how to do it myself, so they'd have to teach themselves because they knew mom didn't know how to do all that stuff. So each summer, it wasn't mom in control. It was them in control. Now, they had to clear stuff with me. They had to tell me what was their plan. And I would assist them in trying to locate resources if they were having some trouble with it. But it was solely in their hands. I was merely just supervising up over the top and saying, you know, OK, just a little nudge here, a little nudge there if it seemed like they needed it. But Here's what I've found as the kids have gotten older. My, my son graduated, and then he's now, he has been working in education. And he says that he's very surprised at how little, even from the teachers, how little the teachers are interested sometimes in just learning on their own. They, they, they have to have somebody teach them. And he said, He's told me that those summers taught him how to learn and taught him how to take initiative with his own learning. But he says he often doesn't see that in just the, the, general, uh, the general population inside of the schools. I think because they haven't experienced it. I, I love that. And I love what you've done. And I think what your son said is sort of reflective of the degree to which our institutions, especially if you think about the banks and the pharmaceutical companies, they kind of depend on us not taking initiative, right? I mean, if we actually started eating healthy food, we wouldn't take as many medications. So that's not actually profitable. So there is this societal dilemma, right, of, of within institutional culture and society, how do you teach independence, 
right? And the, the using the word learning revolution and revolutionary, I mean, there's a there's an intended um, there's an intended connection there, right? Because if you think about sort of societies before democratic practices, there actually needed to be a revolution, and and, and you could make the case that. The, the revolution that's never been happening in education that somehow we feel like needs to happen is for students to actually take charge of their own education. Here's the, here's the pushback I get. Right, so, so Tammy, you did a good job, I think, describing kind of the way in which teachers are part of this same cycle, or can be. So I gave a talk that touched on some of these topics, and I sat next to a, a, a superintendent who said to me, well, everything you say is good, but you know, the top 10% will always rise to the top. You know, it's just sort of inevitable. And I thought, okay, so do we actually really believe in the inherent worth and value of every child? Or do we fall back on, you know, that's nice platitude, but the truth is, that's not actually true. Okay, I didn't realize we were only five minutes left, and I know that there's closing and all kinds of stuff that happens here. Peggy, what, how do I wrap up here in a way that you feel good about? Are we done? Do I? How much time do you need? Oh, yeah. Questions. So, do your hands sweat when you think of becoming a learning revolutionary? Does it scare you? I mean, I think I'm, this is not an exaggeration. I, I spent some significant time in India a couple of years ago asking this question, right? But Martin Luther King, Gandhi, people I really admire, they actually had to stand up and be counted. They actually had to. Take, they had to accept that hard things would happen in their lives. They had to be willing to take, make sacrifices. Anytime you question an institution, you're, you come out of the institutional, you, you lose the benefits that are associated with, with conforming to the institutional model. So, so the moment you say, I believe something different, you may actually have very tangible consequences in your life. So you'd have to believe this is an important enough issue that it's not okay that the way we treat children is not OK. It's like we're feeding McDonald's hamburgers, low nutrition value food, to large numbers of students every day. And they're not actually, you know, they may not be starving, but they're not healthy. And so at some point, can you, are you willing to stand up and say, you know, I'm going to say this even if I get asked to speak at conferences less, or I, whatever the other consequence is. Eileen says, I work with gifted students every day, and I really value a work ethic over a high IQ. They need to have a passion and perseverance to be successful. Yeah, and do your kids, I mean, do, do most students know that? I would suggest that most of the people I talk to who, who left school not as honor students feel broken, that, that one of the large consequences of the system is they don't even know how to approach the feelings of brokenness that have come to them, that they don't know that perseverance and hard work are going to be their, their key. But so Sherry makes a reference to George Carlos's innovator's mindset, how to develop passion. OK, so I'm going to leave you with a question. Please feel free to correspond with me by email or in whatever way you'd like. If we're looking to do something more than just have a momentary um, interest in, a, in, in, the, in the next new thing, in the next cycle, but to actually really change the system in the same way that the, you know, the formation of the United States sort of radically altered the idea of governance. What would we do in education? And is there a way to move forward? And, and do you feel passionate enough to help figure that out? OK, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Well, some of the questions that went by, Steve, you, at, you answered as they were going by in chat. I captured one. And if you Google search learning and also education, do you get the same results because you were comparing learning and education? Yeah, if you go to my Learning Revolution site, and it's in the um, resources that Peggy's gathered, I've collected hundreds of quotes about learning mm -hmm. and education. And I think historically there's an agreement that learning and education are, are obviously two separate words. Um, and that often, education is the enforced compliance system 
used by one group of people in a society to enforce what others learn. And um, now that's not universal, and we can also talk about the word school and schooling. But I think by and large, we recognize that the concept of learning is uh, an individual um, self-directed activity, or we could recognize that, and that education is a system whereby a certain set of things uh, are believed to, to, to need to be learned by the individuals. OK. And that's the one that I was able and to I'm, capture that was different. Yeah, and we use the words mm -hmm. interchangeably. So that's my own, that's very much my own definition. But I think if you look at all those quotes, you'll see, you know, many, many great people have basically had to say, in order to do the important things I had to do in life, I had to ignore my education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do we really want a system of self-directed learning? I mean, the, the benefits of, an, of our current system are that people buy the same clothing, they go to the same movies, they, they take the drugs that we're told to take, or they, they're okay with the fact that, you know, if you're a saver, you're not actually part of the economy right now. I mean, there is a degree to which our current situation depends on us not questioning the role of the individual versus the institution. And I think nowhere, nowhere better to see that in the, in the education world. So here's a question that seems to spring from some of this. Nina asked that so we would not teach a child to multiply. They would, they would need to know how to multiply. Yeah, and so I know we're over time, so I'll, I'll answer that question very quickly. Respecting the individual's learning process and the value of each individual doesn't mean we don't openly communicate the importance of mm -hmm. memorization, of learning pr particular things that help us to gain a context. Um, you, can, you can respect someone in an apprenticeship role, but still let them know this is what you're going to require, because this is, this is important. It's important for you to know sort of basic facts or, or ways of, of doing math things in order to accomplish other things. But that's a very different approach and construct than just having the requirement without actually discussing why it exists or the need and being in a respectful role, right? So, I mean, you know, there are lots of great examples of formal education systems, lots of private schools and many good public schools that do a really good job of having a learning philosophy that's well communicated, that, that understands the value of individuals coming to their own conclusions but says, in order to do so, we take you through these exercises to get there. I don't think this is saying that you don't have structure or um, formal learning requirements. I think it's changing the nature of whether that's voluntary mm -hmm. and whether it's open. One last, yeah, I'm just going to read says, Paula's question. Yeah. Uh, the dropout rate in our country makes it necessary to start a learning revolution. How can we reach everyone's needs in formal educational settings? Reach, yeah. Um, okay, so Paul, I would say that's a part of the dilemma, which is strict institutionalization is never going to reach everyone's needs, right? So in the same way that we would accept that we don't mandate food, and that that means that not everyone's going to eat healthy food, but we, we create an environment of choice, and we do as much as we can to educate and, and, and support people who have uh, a desire to help neighbors and friends, um, uh, there is a dilemma. The dilemma is that when we try and deliver 100%, I think we may actually de deliver less than um, would happen otherwise. So you know, the, the traditional argument for public schooling as it relates to students is, well, what about the kids who don't have these opportunities at home? And then you'd say, OK, yeah, that's, a, that's actually a real issue, and it's one we need to grapple with as a society. But when we have nationally directed educational initiatives, is it actually better, right? Is the role, uh, uh, our intentions may be good, but is the actual end result what we want? And that's, in many ways, that's a great defining dilemma in American history, right? which is we want to provide, it, it, it's not that we don't 
have sensitivities for people who are poor and difficult circumstances. But you have a, sort of the big gulf in this country between those who believe that that you that that government provides those solutions, and others who would say no, that that actually government with with good intentions that actually ends up backfiring and producing the opposite result. And that's the huge conversation and the difficult one that drives a lot of our political conversation. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, I think we will begin to wrap up. <laughs> yes. Thank you for letting me go on. These are the next shows, and Peggy will will introduce our next topic. Thank you so much, Steve. You have certainly got the juices flowing and have, have brought us all to thinking more deeply about some of these questions. I know I, for one, am going back to re-listen to this and pause and think as we go along. We are excited for our upcoming shows, and we hope all of you will join us every Saturday that you can. Next Saturday, we have a great featured teacher, Shelley Fryer, will be joining us to share all of the amazing sh things she does in her classroom of homeless students. The following weekend, we won't have a show because we all want to go to the Discovery Education Fall Virtual Conference, but on October 29th, we have a great presentation by Matt Buchanan, who's going to teach us and share with us the Orange Slice Rubric, which is a, a Google add-on that or extension that he has created that will make your life amazing as a teacher providing feedback. November 5th, we have Craig Yen joining us to share on becoming a connected educator with some of his tips and tricks for things he does. November 12th, Alexis Kobo is going to kick off our of code and computational thinking because that comes in early December. And remember, we won't have a show on the November 26th, which is the Thanksgiving weekend in the United States. So I want to thank you all for joining us. And I do want to remind you that the Digital Writing Conference is going on as a mini conference, and it's taking place over four Saturday or Sundays. And tomorrow is the second day. These conferences are fantastic. They're all free. You just have to register so you get the links for the sessions. So take advantage of that as, if you can. And also, this is the link for the Discovery Education Fall Virtual Conference. Again, it's all free, but you do need to register. So uh, uh, the link is in the live binder, and I'll post it once again in the chat. So be sure to join um, that uh, conference. Steve mentioned the Learning Revolution Project. Here's our slide that shows you what the Learning Revolution Project's about. It's all of his resources gathered together in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for Blackboard Collaborate Room for free, as long as you make the session public. As you exit the session, the survey window should open up in your browser. You can get to the survey by taking the link that will be in the chat, or the log, or the link in the live binder as well. Once you complete that survey, you can request a professional development certificate that will print out your name, thanks to Patty. Please ask for a, uh, or use a, a personal email address to ask for this rather than a school email address. Schools tend to block it from getting to you. Special thanks for our special guest, Steve Hargadon. Uh, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for a webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming. <laughs>